National Broadcasting Company invites you to listen to Glenn Miller's music. Chesterfield time. Hi, soldiers. This is Alan Prescott calling the shots for Glenn Miller and his orchestra. This French aristocrat decided he had to act swiftly, surely, and wisely. But he had not yet secured the gold in the safe in the chateau. He pondered the possibility of sending the gold to Switzerland, but he instantly spat at the thought. Nazis and other criminals kept their money in Swiss banks, and he wanted no part of that supposedly neutral nation. Never for a minute did this man contemplate leaving France with or without his vast amount of gold. He did quickly envision the Maison d'Ete in Roussillon. The barn on that property was immense. It held many hiding places. It could become a veritable treasure trove. Guillaume would place the gold into fabric pouches that he would then stuff inside canvas bags. The sewing box of his mother was still in her room. He would have enough supplies to sew those bags shut. His sewing skills were rudimentary, but he did not want to involve his maid, Francine, in this activity. He did not want her or any other servant in the chateau to know anything about his plans, these decisions which he was in the process of formulating. Of the fate of the family business, Guillaume was undecided. That previous year, Guillaume had been named the president of Jardin Vallon. This family-owned company was a successful perfume distillery and supplier of raw materials to the perfume industry, which at that time was centered in grass. Guillaume's father, Count Augustin de Vallon had founded this company in 1910. Through social and business contacts, Jardin Vallon had become a major supplier of jasmine and other natural aromas to the French perfume industry. He soberly understood that the conquest of France by the Germans would put an end to most businesses that would not be of use to the Nazis and their war machine. Guillaume stared across the room at Cherry Wood Half Moon Table. Atop the table was a statue. This objet d'art was his favorite in the entire chateau. His eyes became fixed on this bronze statue of a woman veiled in a Greek peplos. This art deco design was sensual without being indecent, lithe yet muscular, active in his passivity. Within his calm contemplation of this image of beauty, the face and voice of Camille Richard filled his consciousness. The eyes of this man filled with tears. He wept as he decided upon the middle of May as the optimal time to relocate Camille and little Gabrielle from Paris. He tentatively established that date, unless events became too accelerated and threatened to choke any escape routes prior to that point in time. He was already making plans to prepare the Maison d'Ete in Roussillon. Guillaume wiped his tears from his face. He noticed that his skin was cool to the touch. He'd become chilled in this room even though the fire in the hearth was more than ample. Perhaps it was an attempt by his body to relax and calm his mind. Guillaume knew that he needed time to adjust to the fuller and deeper implications of the coming months. He needed to focus on the essential and to achieve what was necessary. Any other conduct would consist of fear and panic, hopelessness, shame, confusion, even despair. He would grab hold of each strand of courage and he would weave with it each gossamer thread of fortune until he grasped the foundation of faith. Only then would he ascertain what was real. Only then would he understand the heartbeat in each minute. Only then would he gain access to the road which had to rise before him. 
He therefore took his first tentative steps away from the life of the French aristocrat. He only vaguely perceived before him the passage which extended like a huge open hand of freedom. He knew that he could say nothing of these ominous visions and misty reveries to anyone. In time, he would speak to Camille of the truths that moved him now with defiance, duty, and a degree of despondence. For the present, Guillaume understood that this French woman and child formed the unspoken nucleus of his new life. Shelter than he would, or he would fail miserably at all that he sought to achieve with his new life, this embryo of self, just hours old. gray blue skies of a Paris were filled with rain. A black-haired man knocked on the door of a first-floor appartement located adjacent to the Bois de Boulogne in the 16th arrondissement. It was 6.30 in the morning on the 15th of May, 1940. Dawn had broken ominously with shadows of clouds, more than clouds themselves. A slender woman with chestnut-brown hair opened the door. She stepped aside. The man strode into the vestibule, carrying two stacks of newspapers. He set the stacks down on the hardwood floor. The woman closed the door and clicked the lock. She stared at the man, and she felt a sudden rush of emotion akin to apprehension, but tinged with fear. Why are you here, Guillaume? The eyes of this Frenchwoman moved from his face to the stacks of newspapers. Camille, there is not much time. You must pack your household and as many of your belongings from this apartment as you can. There is little time to waste. You must déménager as quickly as possible. You may bring your cherished possessions and, of course, all of your clothes. Guillaume looked at the pale blue upholstery of the settee. You may bring small pieces of furniture, such as the settee, but the larger pieces must stay. Of course, you will want to bring your books. The phony war is over. Churchill is now the Prime Minister in Britain. The future does not bode well for France, and especially for Paris. It is safer for you and Gabriel to move out of Paris now, today, this morning. Guillaume lowered his head slightly. He said in a soft, sad tone, Soon Paris will be overrun with German soldiers. Camille felt her heart pound. 
Time felt as if it stood still, but also raced ahead of her. I do not understand. Her dark green eyes narrowed. Yes, there have been the air raid sirens. Les Pays Bas have been invaded, but... There is not much time, Camille. In a matter of weeks, Paris will be occupied by the Germans. If you do not leave Paris soon, it will be too late. No. Her voice was harsh, yet within the determination of her fierce denial, this French woman sensed that this French man was correct. Defined with insight and armed with information, he had come to rescue her and her child. She stood up and looked into the eyes of this man. Those sad eyes were so blue and bright, so beautiful and so full of pathos and determination. Camille knew that she could not refuse this man his sudden, unexpected act of mercy and heroism. Guillaume had contacts, business contacts, perhaps even personal contacts, who had supplied him with this horrible information. Camille also knew that Guillaume was not a man to make any decision on the spur of the moment. She knew too well that he was methodical and systematic in his planning, precise in his organization and flawless in his execution of any plan. Deliberation in all of its meanings was a talent unique to this Frenchman. Would you mind telling me where we are going? There is my mother's maison d'été in Roussillon. Her summer house has been vacant. Guillaume raised his hand into a fist. Since her death four years ago, we shall create a story for you. A story? Oui, you will need a story for a false identity. Guillaume. Camille slowly widened her eyes with a calm sense of disbelief and a controlled inner diffusion of horror. I do not understand the need for lying. This man looked solemnly at this woman. Within a month, Camille, France will be at war, real war. With the arrival of war, everyone will learn to live in the atmosphere of falsehood. Do you understand me now? Camille eyed this man and then she sighed. Who would believe our truth? Truth is quickly becoming a dangerous commodity, Camille. During our drive to Roussillon, I shall tell you more, much more, of the coming fall of France. It will be a long trip. After several months in Roussillon, there was within Camille a sense that life was turning a corner, although she scarcely knew how she was turning this corner, or what direction she would now take in life. She thought that her every step was a conscious though not facile step forward. Camille was not aware that she was undergoing a rather permanent metamorphosis. Camille Richard would ultimately undergo a transformation from a Parisienne who had been unexpectedly transplanted to Roussillon into a capable, dignified countrywoman. And the property of the Maison d'Ete would become a thriving country estate. But for now, this Parisienne would find in these early months that her simple deeds of resistance granted her a sense of moral rebirth and emotional endurance. The stability of her structured schedule granted her the courage to quietly and secretly take part in small but crucial acts of resistance. Forging documents and identity papers, copying and passing on the textier advice, 
creating avenues of rescue and escape for Jewish refugee children. Those clandestine activities would provide this Parisienne with a renewed sense of living, true living, a life with a purpose beyond the narrow confines of the self. Those two spheres of her life in Roussillon, overt and covert, public and secret, legal and illegal, created a balance within this Frenchwoman that greatly aided her in adjusting to life in Provence. Camille quickly forgot the calibrated existence that she'd left behind in Paris. The exigencies of life in Roussillon filled her with more than lists in her mind of things to do. They filled her days and nights with meaning, this profound sense of fulfillment which had theretofore eluded her. Camille began to see that a life filled with activity suggests purpose, but busyness can conceal emptiness within. Camille Richard had begun to relinquish her tense grasp of the world she once knew in Paris. She understood that her world there had become a shadow of the past, a vast shadow of that past, wherein she could no longer look for answers to the life she needed to live that day. That world of the past had succumbed to the darkness of conquest. Camille knew that she dared not cling to it, lest she become part of that darkness and the conquest. There in Provence, the sun burned brightly and relentlessly. The sun became a symbol of defiance for this Parisienne, who felt it daily and sensed its unyielding energy. The sun was a form of life. With it, Camille grew in spirit and in resistance to the darkness of the occupation. SOE officials sized up Arthur Carmichael. They assessed his personal, educational, and military backgrounds, perused his qualifications, analyzed his personality, scrutinized his willingness, and gave him a thorough physical examination. They then agreed to accept him as a volunteer for the Allies. Through the proper channels, Arthur was assigned to the SOE from the U.S. Army. Arthur Boucher Carmichael was then recast as Arthur Boucher a practitioner in veterinary medicine for farm animals, traveling to the provinces to provide services to cultivateurs. Arthur received exactly 10 days of physical, mental, and emotional training, 
as well as thorough indoctrination and instructions, just in case he was captured by the enemy. It was not the most thorough of preparations, but the SOE needed to find out as much information as they could, as quickly as they could, regarding any resistance in France. This covert mission was codenamed Operation Nottingham. Its stated objective was to assess the strength of the internal resistance in France and the willingness of these French to conduct sabotage, surveillance, and counterintelligence. His age had been shaved by eight years, so that he was supposedly 30, and thus had not been anywhere near the age for requisite military service for the Great War. Since Arthur looked a decade younger than his true age of 38, this fiction was perhaps one of the most believable ones within his cover story. Say it's only a paper moon Sailing over a cardboard sea But it wouldn't be make-believe If you believed in me Yes, it's only a canvas sky Hanging over a muslin tree The droning noise of the engines from the B-24 Liberator drowned out most of the lucid thoughts of this man, but this din did not overcome his silent confessions, prayers, regrets, and fervent dreams. The side door opened. Arthur felt a cold blast of air from the high altitude. Adrenaline now fully energized this man. He saw that the plane was flying below the clouds, but there weren't many clouds to conceal the bright light of the full moon. Arthur stooped and stepped into the open doorway. His heart was pounding. He felt a thrill of excitement and a gripping rush of fear. Arthur gave his dispatcher two thumbs up and then he jumped feet first from the large opening that was the doorway of the airplane. His knees were slightly bent, his feet apart, as he hung loosely in the air, rushing fiercely and rapidly past him. After slowly counting to ten, Arthur pulled the cord. The silk parachute billowed above him. Below him lay the sacred soil of France. Time seemed to stand still and yet collapse upon him. He pushed his feet together as he spotted the dark ground coming up to meet him. Arthur then looked away from the sacred soil of France, as he taught so many other men to do. Nothing creates panic more than the sight of the earth, or La France, about to smack you. Suddenly, Arthur landed hard against the moist, hard ground. He nearly caught his balance from the forward momentum, but then he tumbled gently onto his knees. On his knees, Arthur Boucher stared up at the sky and thanked God. He gazed at this vault of heaven. It was black, but the full moon was bright, milky white, and eerie. This moon glow could lead as many Germans to him as might be possible to pounce upon him in one fell swoop. It was quiet, very quiet. There were no birds singing, no wind whistling through the trees, not even the sounds of an owl. The moon glow created a sense of wonderment and uncertainty. Calmly, but with a sense of adventure, Arthur stared around him. He felt alert and excited. The odor and feel of the moist, loamy earth filled his senses, and he experienced a lengthy déjà vu. Somewhere within the past, at some point in time that had been lost, but was now being rediscovered, this man had breathed in this aroma of dark, peaty, mossy soil. He had felt this rich, peaty ground, and he had sensed the nurturing embrace of homecoming. He believed that a part of him, Arthur Carmichael, had always longed to be this man, Arthur Boucher. That hidden part of him was undergoing and retour au foyer, a homecoming. This strange sensation of familiarity struck a chord deep within the solitary man. He felt tears rush to his eyes as one part of him was seized by the sober awareness of being completely alone and vulnerable in a foreign land a nation occupied by a vicious enemy. Another part of this man felt that he was now living his part. Arthur now fully dedicated himself to help to liberate France. He did not know what the ultimate cost would be for him to play his part in this glorious quest, 
but he knew that to not come to the aid of the French, to not fight to free them from the barbed wire and the boots and the shackles of the Germans, that cost was a burden that his conscience could not bear. He was a stranger in this land, and a wanderer, but he would use the inspiration of Polaris, that fixed, almost motionless bright point of light in the sky. It was this North Star that the ancient mariners used to navigate and chart their courses. Artur would strive to remain just as fixed in his quest for liberty, just as Polaris remains fixed in the sky, and just as all of life revolves round freedom, but remains always anchored beneath this vault of heaven by the Almighty. was just past half full, so it graciously illuminated the pathway of this resistor. This light also revealed to any onlooker the movements of a man walking after midnight on the streets of any city. Guillaume was keenly aware of the double-edged sword of the moonlight for any person acting in resistance to the enemy. Guillaume chose to work alone, and he chose carefully his circuitous routes along the back roads of Provence. He decided to drive first to one of the most dangerous and treacherous of places. Toulon. This port city attracted crime in the same ways that any other port city did, only now there was the added corruption of the black market and Vichy officials. The major danger to Guillaume, however, came not from thieves or from any criminal offenses, but from the French military police officers called gendarmes. Toulon was not only an excellent port, it was a major French naval base and the proud site of the French fleet. The harbor of Toulon is one of the finest natural havens for anchoring vessels on the Mediterranean Sea. The Free French, as well as Vichy, were well aware of its potential use for covert operations. Guillaume was therefore certain that the area in and around this military port would be crawling with gendarmes. He parked the moving truck on the edge of the old town of Toulon, the historic center situated between the military port and La Cour Lafayette, location of the Daily Marché. He then slowly walked within the shadows of old brick buildings, heading toward the long avenue called Le Cour Lafayette. This route runs through the heart of Toulon. It was on the narrow cobblestone streets of the old town of Toulon that Guillaume experienced his most intensive training to date as a French resistor. The muted clicking of shoes on the cobblestones behind him initially aroused in Guillaume the normal instinctive reaction that would arise in any creature sensing attack from the rear. In Guillaume de Vallon, however, this reaction was heightened by his usual sense of claustrophobia, even in situations remotely resembling this one. His sense of fear was deepened by the knowledge that he, Consang Guillaume de Vallon, was acting as an enemy of l'État, the state of France. Guillaume did not wish to suffer the same fate as Jean Valjean in the Bagne of Toulon, 19 years of hard labor. He felt a fine film of perspiration form on his forehead and at the back of his neck. It was two o'clock in the morning. The warm, steamy air in this port city was due to the Levant, the stormy wind from the east that brings moisture from the Mediterranean. Guillaume casually slowed his pace. He refused to turn to look behind him and thereby confront his pursuer and the softly clicking heels. The footsteps slowed their pace and then they stopped. Guillaume had not yet arrived at Le Cour Lafayette. He pondered briefly his next move, and then he ambled further down this narrow street. The sound of the footsteps grew louder until they came beside Guillaume. Guillaume stood still and glanced at the officer in the dark blue suit with the KP. This dark blue hat with the gold stripes became lowered as the gendarme eyed Guillaume. With narrowed black eyes, the gendarme assessed this young man. He looked clean-shaven. He was still wearing his work attire, the clothes of an artisan. Guillaume had decided not to wear the Basque beret, thereby resisting the lure of trouble. Ma femme est ronfle. My wife, she snores. 
Guillaume held his palms up and shrugged. It was an immaculate imitation of a Provencal peasant. Guillaume smiled meekly as he recalled Camille, wryly commenting that he might have needed this ruse one day. That day had come, but it had been night and not day. The gendarme hooked a thin thumb in the air. Vaton, get out of here. The gendarme had repulsed Guillaume with a blunt phrase and demoted him with the use of the familiar form of you, tu. Guillaume felt the free French poster slip slightly downward within his jacket. Je vais. I'm going. Guillaume walked away before the gendarme could say a word. With his back to the police officer, Guillaume quickly pushed the posters back up inside his jacket. I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this part of mine embraces all day through. In that small cafe, the park across the way, the children's carousel, the chestnut tree, the wishing well. I'll be seeing you in every lovely summer's day, in everything that's light and gay. I'll always think of you that way. I'll find you in the morning sun, and when the night is new, I'll be looking at the moon.